Well, hello guys. Uh, like I said, I hope to be back at you with another video lecture this week because the issues of war, terrorism, torture are pretty big and we only made it through just war theory. So I wanted to get to some of the other stuff. Uh, and a, a clarification because I don't think I made it that, that clear for the lecture. Uh, that, that just war theory is its own thing. It's only about the justifications of war and is kind of a, a, a subset offshoot within this the, the general realm of, of moral theories. Um, it is kind of in some ways, uh, you know, the application when we talked about the four, the four realms, you know, metaethics, uh, descriptive, normative and applied well that that that's the, the the normative to the applied actually the applied ethics side of it uh, whereas most of our other moral theories are more on the normative end so that's really where that one lives uh, doesn't necessarily fall under any of the other moral theories though it has a lot in common with natural law, of course, because it shares the author of Thomas Aquinas. Um, but I, I did want to bring it back around into the other moral theories and to talk a bit about your papers. Uh, I've got everything graded that was in as of Monday night, maybe even Tuesday, so, uh, good job on that. Uh, some of you have some uh, tweaks. Uh, for that, remember, you just need to upload uh, just the things, the corrections I want. You don't have to redo the whole paper. Please don't make me hunt for the things that you actually changed. Uh, just upload a second document that is just the things that I, I asked you to fix. Um, and for those that are unsure or maybe have some major fixes on the way, um, I'm going to give you another example of the kind of thing that I'm looking for. And, and it is this, as we talk about uh, terrorism and torture and, and those other things that come up around that, uh, you know, in our post 9-11 world, right? Um, I don't think any of you guys were born then when that happened. You have grown up, I think by and large, in this different era. I was 23, 24 when it happened. So I remember where I was, exactly what I was doing on September 11th. Um, I was in my graduate studies at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, uh, preparing to become a, an ordained minister. And have, was it was kind of an off day for me. I didn't have any classes um, and was in my apartment there on campus, student housing. Uh, and my wife was at work, and uh, no, actually, she was doing her internship. Uh, she was in Boston. Uh, Gordon Conwell is about 30, 35 miles, uh, as I'm looking at it for you, north, northeast of Boston. Remember, if Massachusetts looks like a, looks like a gun. It's kind of up in the hammer a little bit. And, um, yeah, just happened to, you know, take a break from studying and translating and turned on the TV and, you know, somewhere between the, the first planes hitting the towers, um, and then the live footage and reports from Washington and the field in Pennsylvania. So yeah, uh, I grew up and, you know, uh, back home was Eastern Ohio. So we flew in, in and out of Logan Airport, which is where two of the planes took off from, 
into Pittsburgh, which was near where the fourth plane eventually crashed. So, you know, and uh, the other thing that I suddenly realized was that I was uh, working as a just pulpit supply, filling in the pulpit for a church that was undergoing some transition between ministers. Um, and I had to preach that Sunday. Yeah. That was my introduction. So I remember why. I, I know why they chose Logan Airport as, as the place to, uh, to go through to, to hijack the planes. It's because security there was a literal joke. After that, things changed. Because of the threat of terrorism, the United States changed. Um, privacy has all but disappeared. And we live in a surveillance state. And, you know, we pay for the privilege. When I was a kid, we made fun of the conspiracy theorist, you know, the person who said, they put trackers in your dental work. You got to wear your tinfoil hat to block the signals. They don't need to do that. We pay for it. GPS, listening device, browser history, it's all right here. Aren't we smart? So, yeah. The question of, is it okay to torture a terrorist went from just a vague question to, hell yeah, let's do it. Because fear, truly fear changed our world. Now we live in the grip of a fear of a virus. And people are reacting to that in various ways. Some are literally hiding, afraid. Some have been affected and have lost loved ones already. Some have lost jobs or are looking at possible loss of income and a recession, depression looming on the horizon for the economy as a whole. We see how some people react is by making jokes or threats, uh, you know, coughing on people and threatening to spread the virus. Others who fear that it's all just a part of some giant conspiracy. Fear. Fear is when we throw all of our morals out the window, right? We find out who we really are when push comes to shove. So let's, let's take it. Let us say, for the sake of a moral dilemma, that some insane terrorist supervillain, you guys know I love my comics, uh, has gone on television and said that they have planted bombs in buildings all over Canton and Akron. And unless we pay them $20 million, things are going to go boom. Uh... We don't have time and money and resources to catch this person. We don't know where they are hiding and where they sent the signal. But we did catch their family, the terrorist's wife and children, as they were trying to catch a flight at the Canton Akron Airport. And let us suppose that you are the sheriff or 
FBI, NSA, ATF, whatever. You're the person on the ground, there on the tarmac, and you've caught them. And the news cameras show up. And suddenly, you are presented with an opportunity. You can't find the terrorist, but you've got their family. Maybe let's see how they like it. And an idea crops up in your head. You could put the family in, on the, in front of those cameras, and you could tell the terrorist, we have them, and I have a gun. And you point it at the wife or one of the children. Or at least you have this idea that you could do this. And say, Mr. Terrorist, turn off the bombs. Or we, I, kill your family. Should you do this? I know. Kind of wild, kind of out there. Can we inflict pain, damage, death on innocent people? And let's say that the wife and the kids, they had no idea, absolutely no idea that their husband slash father was, you know, a terrorist going to do this. They were just trying to get out of Dodge before the obvious happened. For the sake of our argument, let's say that's true. Okay. Well, let's run it through the moral theories, just like you were supposed to do or need to do for your papers or have done or any of that. Hey, it's a fun exercise, at least for me. Ethical egoism. What should you do? Well, what is in my best interest, right? If I'm a law officer, uh, it is my job, my duty to protect and serve, um, to both uphold the law, but also the safety of my people, right? Yeah, I can see how this plays out. I think you could justify the action. Uh, maybe you don't just start with, Killing one of them, maybe you just shoot one of them in the hand, right? Let's let's start small and show that you mean business. You know, they they no they, they'll, they'll live, they'll recover, right? Um, but it sure hurts. So let's do that. And let's say that you're put on trial, you know, and but your defense is. I was doing what was in my best interest to be the hero, to save the day, to get the pat on the back, to save lives. Yeah, you do it, right? If you're a utilitarian, what do you do? Well, of course you do it, right? Because the math is simple. You got Let's say the wife and four kids. You got five family members against how many people live in Canton and Akron? 20,000? But maybe he only planted a few bombs, so that's maybe 2,000 lives. And depending on how things work out, maybe only a couple hundred would actually end up severely injured or dead. The math still works out in your favor. Even if you lose your job and don't, you, know, you don't get to be sheriff anymore, you still save lives. You know, yeah, you can write a book on that. You can, you can find a second career. That's, you know, at least Fox News would hire you as an analyst. So, yeah, you're good. I think as a utilitarian, we could put the numbers up and should I do it? I must do it. I don't have a choice here, especially if it works. Yeah. And that's why some people don't like the consequentialist theories of 
ethical egoism and utilitarianism. Right? We can do the math. We can see it. We can put those numbers there. 200 is more than 5. Done. So let's go to our, our good old friend Kant. What does he say? Well, universal maxim. Would I let anybody else do this? Yes, I would. I would let anyone else, you know, if it's not the sheriff, then it's the FBI or the ATF or the CIA or the NSA or the ABC. I don't know. Yeah, I'd let them do it. But remember, universal maxim means everyone. So I have to put my shoes, my feet into everybody's shoes. That includes the terrorist and his family. If I was them... Would I approve of this action? Well, yes, please kill my child if it stops my husband. Mm, no, no, sorry. That doesn't fly. We failed the first one. We've already failed the theory. But just for kicks, let's go through the next one, and that is the means and principle. By threatening to kill or even killing the members of this terrorist family, am I using them solely as a means to an end? Are they just a tool? Yeah. Yeah, they are the means by which I end this, and I am using them solely, exclusively for that purpose. They are not volunteering for this. There is no payment. There is no exchange of equivalents. There's no, uh, uh, you know, what's the word? Consent, right? Mm -mm. Do it or blow their head off. The end. So we have also failed the means end principle. Remember, according to Kant, it was, you can never treat another person solely as a means to an end. In life, everything is a means to an end, right? But we could say that, hey, the terrorist is treating us, the citizens of Canton and Akron, only as a means to an end. He's willing to kill us to make money. He's not playing by the means end principle. Do I have to? Is he still a person if he's not doing that? Ah, no. He's a terrorist. Now, terrorists aren't people. We don't negotiate with terrorists. We just kill them. Right. They're not people. They don't have rights. And indeed, that's exactly what our nation did. After September 11th, the Bush administration, their de his Department of Justice, under the direction of Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld and the input of a few others, they rewrote the rules, right? Because you could not torture the soldier of another country. If we captured an Iraqi, we couldn't torture them. We could interrogate them to a degree, question them, you know, certainly if they were an officer or had some useful intelligence, but you couldn't torture them legally under the Geneva Conventions. But we did this funny little end around. We said, well, a terrorist, a member of Al-Qaeda, and then later ISIS and whatnot, but Al-Qaeda, the Taliban at that point in time, well, they're not members of another country's army. They're, they've joined this multinational terrorist network. They're not really soldiers, are they? They're, they, they don't have a uniform. They don't fight under a, a country's flag. They're, they're ideo ideological terrorists. I'm sure they might justify it with religious nonsense, but it, that isn't even reflective of Islam. Never mind that. Uh, but we'll use the, the fear of that other religion to help justify our, you know, good Christian virtues. Um, no. If they're not members of another army, if they're not citizens of a country, then 
They don't have the rights of a citizen or a soldier. And if they don't have the rights of a citizen or a soldier, then we don't have to treat them as people we can torture away. That's exactly what they did. That was part of the Patriot Act and other... Uh, some of it was executive order and decisions and just changes by the Justice Department. They kind of did an end around on Congress and bypassed all of their stuff to help make it work. So yeah, if they're not people, all the better. Okay, how about natural law? Well, let's look at purpose. And remember, here's the one where uh, uh, several of you students, uh, uh, and it's a, it's a common thing, you kind of trip up, you kind of jump on one purpose and that's it, but you really need to, to walk around it, as I say. So okay, there's my purpose. What is my purpose as a law enforcement officer? Right? To protect and serve, to preserve life, public safety, yada yada. Got it. Well, what's, the, what's the purpose of this terrorist wife and family? Well, her purpose is to get her kids out of harm's way. Well, I've thwarted that purpose. Me, you, whoever, this law enforcement person. What is the purpose of the terrorist? Well, we would say that's not a good purpose, right? To use fear to gain money or some political ideological goal, right? Um, yeah. Hmm. So yeah, we can, yeah, their purpose is to die, and us, our purpose, that's, that's not good. Right, so let's work it through the doctrine of double effect, right? Because we do have this conflict now. That's the key, is that you find the conflict of purpose. The purpose of the wife and family is to live. My purpose is to stop the terrorist, and I can do that by killing them, so... Mm. My purpose is also to protect and serve. These are people in my jurisdiction. They didn't commit a crime. Is it okay for me to execute them? To prevent another crime? Alright. Is the action in and of itself good, bad, or morally neutral? Hmm. Is it good or bad for me, regardless of the circumstance? That's the key here. To kill an innocent person. Hmm. Well, I guess not, huh? Right. Uh, we'll skip number two, because number two stinks. Number three, intent. Is my intent good? Yes, my intent is noble. I'm trying to save more people's lives. Does the good equal or outweigh the bad? Rule number four. Yes, we prove that with utilitarianism. That's why you do that one first. So you can just substitute that argument here. Done. Am I using the bad effect to cause the good effect? Let us define. What is the bad effect? Kill the terrorist family. What is the good effect? Save the lives of the people of Canton and Akron. Am I using that to cause the good in this situation? Ooh, yes I am. That is a violation. So if you were even questionable about rule number one, we certainly failed rule number two, which is where we usually fail. Uh-oh. So yes, it fails both natural law and the categorical imperative. Once again, the non-consequentialists don't let us do the thing. Classic virtue is another trippy one, right? Because now we get out of the realm of is the action right or wrong, but is the person good or bad and, and, and all of that. So what are the virtues at play? Well, law and justice, saving lives versus taking life, innocence and guilt, terror and torture. The, I know those aren't virtues, but it, they're, they're, they're the issues at play. Role model. Hmm. Who's a good role model here? Uh, what would John Wayne do? What would Batman do? What would Spider-Man do? What would the Flash do? The Flash, he would run around and find the bombs before they went off, but we don't have him. 
Ah. Now, can't think of a hero who would take this action. Some of you might say, well, maybe Frank Castle, the Punisher. He's not a hero. He's barely an anti-hero. He's a bad guy who does bad things to worse people. It's not a hero. And where are we on the golden mean? All right, well, let's let's take a look. I guess on one end we could, you know, do nothing. Say la vie, right? You know? On the other end, we could, okay, yeah, do something that isn't this. Uh, go through the normal channels of investigation. Uh, rely on my forensic experts. Try to triangulate the signal, right? Where's my science nerds at? I could employ other techniques, right? I could just question the family. They might be innocent. They might not know anything specific, but they might know something. Well, he did have a storage locker somewhere. Yeah? Where does this action fall? Yeah, it seems way over there. It's off the scale. Pretty extreme violation. A good person would not kill an innocent person. Right? Certainly not. Where does this fall within the ethics of care? Well, let's look at the relationships, right? Yeah, we could draw our diagram. Uh, sorry, I didn't draw a picture beforehand, but... Yeah, the wife, the husband, right? The terrorist and his kids. If I do this action, I sever those relationships. They're broken. They're gone forever. Of course, you could say, well, the, the terrorist kind of broke them. Yes, but who knows? I mean, why is he doing this? What is his purpose? What is his motivation? Maybe it's because one of the kids is sick and needs $20 million for cancer treatment because of our broken health care system. Right? Hmm. That's, that's a kicker. So, yeah, I, I think this breaks ethics of care. Would my community trust me to continue to be their sheriff? Would they vote for me at the next election if I did this? If I killed a child on TV? In the moment, in desperation, we might be in favor of it. But then after you reflect, you're like, you know, I, I, I don't want that guy carrying a gun anymore. Yes, yeah, so that might disrupt the other relationships in my life. So there it is. That's the kind of process that we need to go through when we work it through the moral theories. So just what is what is torture? You know, it has often been alluded to as the means of extracting information, right? Torture is to inflict harm, pain, suffering, physical, emotional, etc., either as a form of punishment or to get something from the person, information, satisfaction, right, a, a, an admission of guilt. And where is that line between interrogation and questioning and torture? And again, you know, our Bush administration uh, created that whole new category called enhanced interrogation, right? It's not torture, it's interrogation plus. Um, right? He 
Here's what we know. It doesn't work. It really doesn't. Um, and the reason is, I mean, sometimes it might. And that's what gives it some credibility. But the truth is that, you know, if you hook various parts of my body to a car battery and turn up the juice, I'll tell you anything to make it stop. And that anything I tell you might be the truth, or it might not. It just might be whatever you want to hear. It's whatever just to make it stop. It's a real mixed bag. And even the experts in the CIA will say that. And I, you know, again, I should have proof. Uh, but I'm kind of throwing this lecture together last minute. Uh, been working on a lot of other things. You're, you know, grading your papers kind of uh, took some time away from other things, uh, like the other classes I'm taking. So, you know, you can look that up on your own. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll post some links later this week. Uh, sometime tomorrow, I'll try to try to do that for you guys. Um, that show that it's not very effective, if it's effective at all. Uh, it has, there's a lot of mixed bag research on it. Well, what about a lie detector? What about it? Again, the... Data on that, any and all systematic studies that have any scientific credibility show that lie detectors don't prove anything. They can detect a person's elevated heart rate or certain physiological responses, but then you have to interpret that, right? Just because my heart's beating faster doesn't mean that I'm lying that I'm telling the truth. It just means that my heart is beating faster. Maybe I don't like being in a small room. I might be claustrophobic. That would cause a person to have an accelerated heart rate, sweat, stutter, look around, glance a lot. Maybe I forgot to take my ADD meds this morning and I'm a little bit jerry, you know, yeah. Or you know, maybe I took a little too much meth and have the same response. They don't work. At least not in the way that we want them to. Certainly not in the way that TV and Hollywood tells us. Oh, it's a cure-all, Maury. No, sorry guys. It's BS. And some of the world's best... Mm, best. Mm, uh, most infamous... Yeah, that's the better word. Uh, most infamous serial killers have been great at fooling them. Because people with a psychopathic personality, they don't think they're lying. They can be absolutely calm. A true sociopath who feels no remorse will have no physiological response. They've created their own reality, and they live fully in it. It's the rest of the world that's nuts. It's the rest of the world that is wrong. Fun stuff, right, guys? Yeah. So you see, a large part of it depends on the labels we use and the stories we tell ourselves. I remember watching the presentation that was made by Colin Powell, then uh, the Secretary of Defense under George Bush, George W. Bush. After September 11th, he went to the United Nations, Colin Powell did, and presented the evidence that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction and was actively working to build nuclear weapons that they had on public record said that they wanted to destroy Israel. 
And he also presented evidence, uh, you know, showing that Saddam and his regime had financially supported Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda, and thus they had a direct hand in the September 11th attacks. And those of you who are good students of history will also note that it was George W. Bush's father, George H.W. H.W. Bush, who was president when we fought Iraq the first time around, after Iraq had invaded Kuwait. <laughs> we didn't depose Saddam Hussein then. We went so far, said, ha, that's it, cut it out, and then pulled back. And a lot of people said that was a mistake. We should have finished the job. So was George W. Bush finishing the job that his father didn't? Was there really a link between Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden? Did he really have weapons of mass destruction and were those mobile trailer units really trying to create nuclear weapons. Well, we invaded, and after 10 years of fighting, uh, toppling this uh, Saddam Hussein's regime, in 10 years of searching, we found nothing. They did have some old uh, mustard gas warheads, shells, etc., uh, from the Soviet Union from, like, the 60s. And that was about it. By the way, some of that stuff ended up in the hands of Syria, who used it on a, their own citizens a few years ago. Um, so, yeah. Oops. But, yeah, there was no link. And I remember watching the presentation that Colin Powell made. It was televised. It was, you know, live. Um, and I said, well, if that stuff is true, then yes, we must invade. You know, I was, I was in favor of a preemptive strike if the intelligence was right. And it turns out that either the intelligence was very wrong or more likely was largely manufactured. But hey, uh, we didn't find that out until afterwards, and hey, we're already here, and we destabilized your government, and then we kind of left, and then ISIS popped up, so now we gotta come back and redo it all. Because we said we weren't in the business of nation building, but if you don't build a nation afterwards, uh, bad things happen. Right? It's true. So where does that leave us? Because we live in this world of weapons of mass destruction. And in fact, we've used them. Right? America built the first nuclear weapon and the second one, and we used them. We used them on the island nation of Japan to end the war in the Pacific. Why? Well, maybe that's a lecture for another day. This is uh, 40 minutes of quite the downer. And I did what I really intended to do, which was to give you guys a big, kind of a, another review of how to work it through the moral theories um, with our ticking time bomb terrorist moral dilemma, um, and talked a little bit more generally about the history of terrorism and torture here in the recent history of the United States. Um, as you know, yes, we did capture many terrorists and terrorist suspects. We 
had them in what called black sites and uh, in Guantanamo Bay, never on U.S. soil, because that would be very illegal. But if we did it somewhere else, well, then, you know, there was no law here, so it's not illegal, right? But this class is concerned not just about the legalities, but the moralities. And, you know, the hit we took in the international community, bringing it back to the, to the ethics of care, when the rest of the world found out that we were torturing even terrorists, they were like, whoa, America, hey, we know you guys love your beer and your guns and your freedom and all that, but whoa. You know? It was a black eye and continues to be and will be a stain on our nation's history. Not that it's the only one. But I think I've done enough to prove to the NSA that maybe they should keep an eye on me, right? Because I'm not an unquestioning patriot. I'm a questioning one. I believe our country is the best. Or at least it could be. And indeed it should be. And that means we need to be better. How do we get there? I know. When I'm dictator of the universe, we'll find out. Right, guys? All right. That's enough for now. Um, I truly hope that you guys are staying safe and healthy. I see your papers. You're doing great work. I really appreciate it. I know some of you are struggling with the technology and access, as well as just struggling financially, socially, mentally, emotionally. Um, I'm here for you. Please know that you know my other job is partially counseling people, and I think we could all do with some sharing. Um, I'm an introvert. Being locked in my house for two weeks is not a problem. Uh, but, you know, even we need to get out once in a while, and I do miss, I miss you guys, I miss the class, I know, it, you think, you might think BS, but no, it's true. Um, to not be there in person is difficult, so, you know, I don't want to leave us on a downer. I want you guys to know that I see what you've been doing, I do appreciate it, you're putting in the work. The finish line is not too far away. Uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel, both for the semester and for this current crisis. Man, we are going to have a story to tell our kids someday. So let's stay safe, that, safe and healthy and make sure we have that story and have those grandkids to tell it to. Bye.